Before I could complain, before I could say anything, he reached back in his pocket, he pulled out that cowboy spur on a stick, and he ran it back down my legs. And one more time, I saw the pinpricks of blood, and though I could wiggle my toes, it was mute corroboration that I had no feeling in my legs. That night, alone in my hospital bed, I cried for the second time. But during the middle of the night when I woke up, I remembered the promise that I made. And I remembered the promise that I was going to walk out of that hospital, that I was going to prove him wrong, that I was going to show him that I could walk. And that gave me renewed energy. That gave me renewed strength. And that very night, I began a new exercise. And rather than just trying to wiggle my toes, I worked on, on strengthening my legs. And I did exercises that required me to push, pull myself to the end of the bed and then try to push myself back up. And I did that for the next four weeks. And finally, I started gaining some strength. But I couldn't tell Dr. Moberly, and I couldn't tell the nurse because I was afraid of what they might do. They would try some way to make me stop doing it. So I could only do it at night when they weren't around. And I had finally gained enough strength or thought I had gained enough strength in my leg that I'd made up my mind tonight was the night. Tonight was the night I was going to walk. So that night when the nurse finally left my room and she turned off the light and turned on the very small night light, I decided this was the night. So I slowly slid my legs over the side of the bed and scooched myself down towards the end and let my feet fall on the floor. And for the very first time in five months, my feet were on the floor. And as I stood there, my legs began to shake and tremble because I had been in bed for almost five months. My legs had atrophied. My legs looked like baseball bats. I looked like I was a polio victim. And I couldn't stand very long, even holding on to the side of the bed. So after a while, I'd have to pull myself back up, catch my breath, and let my legs rest. And then as they would rest, I would slowly put them back down. I had to do that a half a dozen times. And finally, I got to where I could stand on my feet all by myself, but I had to hold on to the bed. And while holding on to the bed, I thought, okay, this is it. This is the night. I'm going to walk. I'm going to take my first step. And with that, I slowly moved my foot forward and dropped it down on the floor. And to do so, I had to leave go of the bed with one hand. And I was okay with that because I could hold on with the other hand. But in order to take the next step, in order to go one more step, I had to leave go of the bed altogether. And that's when I made up my mind I was ready to do this. I was ready to keep my promise. And I put all my weight on my right leg, and I lifted up my left leg, and I plopped it down on the floor. And for the very first time in now over five months, I was unattached to the bed, and I had actually walked. I was beyond myself with excitement and joy. And I had to show them right then and there that I could do this. And I was afraid to go back to bed. I was afraid to sit back down on the bed for fear that I might not be able to get back up again. So I ambled over to the side of the bed. I found the call button. I pushed it knowing that it's going to take the nurse a couple of minutes to show up in my room. And with that, I started walking slowly towards the door. And I got halfway between my bed and the door. Now, you have to remember and understand, it was dark in my room. The only light was a very small night light. The hallway in the hospital was well lit. So the nurse, having heard my call button, or saw the call button being pushed, starts proceeding to my room. Well, by now, I'm standing essentially in front of the door, of this closed door into my room. And I didn't mean to frighten her, but as she walked into my room and her eyes had not yet adjusted to the dark and opened the door, she was standing face to face with a guy who was supposed to be laying in bed. She let out a blood curdling scream. And I don't know if you know how it is in a hospital, but when a nurse at two o'clock in the morning answers a patient's call button and goes to the room and immediately issues a blood-curdling scream, all pandemonium breaks loose. There's total chaos in the hospital. The nurses who are still at the nurse's station do what they're supposed to do. They push the panic button. And when they push the panic button in a hospital, the little blue lights in the ceiling come on. The, 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 the security people show up. All the medical personnel on the floor run to that room to take care of whatever the emergency and whatever the problem is. And as all those people started filtering into my room and circling around me, they all had the same look of befuddlement on their face. They knew I was paralyzed. 
they knew I couldn't walk. And there I was standing in the middle of the room in front of them. Five and a half months as I laid in that hospital bed, an open back hospital gown seemed like a really good idea. But that night as I finally stood on my own feet and all these people were circling around me, it seemed like less good of an idea until I felt that cool breeze. And it wasn't that I wasn't embarrassed, because I was embarrassed, but the cool breeze on my butt meant that I could feel. And it was a neat feeling. Step number three is clearly identify your promise. Most people don't do that. When you ask people what they want or what they want to be when they grow up, you hear all kinds of vague, ambiguous, almost platitudes like, I want to be rich or I want to be famous. So when I start working with people and they tell me they want to be rich or they want to be famous, I say, great, how rich? How famous? Help me identify and help me understand what rich means to you. Help me understand what famous means to you. Because if you can't identify your promise, if you can't clearly identify it, you're going to have great difficulty in achieving it. Think of that childhood game called pin the tail on the donkey. When you don't have the blindfold on and, and the chart is up against the wall and you have the pin in your hand, it's real easy to walk over there and exactly pin the tail where the tail belongs. But when they blindfold you and they spin you around and then they let you loose and tell you to go do the very same thing you just did, it's almost impossible. Why? One thing has changed. You no longer can clearly see the target. So in order to achieve a goal, in order to achieve your promise, you have to clearly identify it. Be as specific as you can about what it is you want and what it's going to look like when you get there. If you can narrow it down, if you can specifically identify it, if you can see it in your mind's eye, if you can absolutely describe it, then it becomes so much easier to achieve. Step number four is identify your personal motivator. Let me explain what that is. In order to achieve a significant goal, in order to achieve a significant promise, you're going to need to have lots and lots of motivation. It's going to be so easy to lose track of what it is you're after. As soon as it becomes difficult, as soon as it becomes challenging, as soon as you become frustrated, as soon as it doesn't show up exactly on time, it's so easy to quit. It's so easy to change your mind and say, oh, gee, I really didn't want that anyhow. But if you have a good motivator, if you have something that will keep you on fire, if you have something that will keep you passionate about achieving this particular objective, then you can face frustration. You can face challenges. You'll find a way to overcome them. And you can, your personal motivator can be either a positive motivator or it can be a negative motivator. Because everything in our life is focused on one of two things. It's either we're trying to move towards pleasure or trying to move away from pain. Your motivator can be either positive or negative. And some of us are more motivated by showing somebody that we can do it. My example of Dr. Moberly. I don't think I'd be walking today if I had a positive motivator. Instead, I had a negative motivator. I found more energy and more strength in showing him that I could walk than I ever could have had if I'd had a positive motivator where I was attempting to do it for someone instead of to show someone. So as you think about your goal, as you think about your promise and how you want to achieve it, try to identify the thing that will motivate you the most. Is it that you want to do it for your family, that you want to please somebody, that you want to help somebody, that you want to do it for all of what we call the good and the right reasons? Or are you doing it for exactly the opposite? that you want to show somebody that you are capable. You want to show somebody that didn't have faith in you. You want to show somebody that said you couldn't do it. And it doesn't matter which one you pick. There's no right or wrong. There's only the one that will work for you. I tell the students I work with of my example, the one that got me through college. Kathy and I met when I was 14 and she was 11. During that era of my time, I was a troublemaker. I was a rascal. I was a 